by Foundations of Writing on the Academic Agency. To write clearly will help you to think clearly. The ability to communicate ideas in lucid prose is foundational to success in many areas, and it is a basic requirement in every walk of life. You will learn the parts of speech and come to understand the core functions of the English language, sentence construction and syntax, punctuation, style, and common mistakes. Once you see how mistakes are made, you will not unsee them. You will know for the rest of your life. Foundations of Writing. Buy it now. For many years, I rated the film American Beauty very highly. As recently as last year, I was still ranking it in my top 100 films at number 30, as you can see here, although I hadn't watched it recently. I did happen to watch American Beauty a couple of weeks back, and, uh, well, let's just say I've changed since the early 2000s, and there were things I saw in American Beauty that uh, I didn't necessarily see before. So in this video, I'm going to explain just how subversive and how um, the film leans on certain liberal principles, certain liberal assumptions um, in ways that are actually quite overt uh, when you come to think about it. So let's start the countdown. Number one, being true to yourself is to remove any modifications you make in your behavior for the sake of social norms. Everything that happens in this film, from Lester's escape uh, from his nine-to-five existence to the kind of dreams of the teenage characters essentially says that people would be a lot happier if they could just quote-unquote be themselves without society telling them how to behave. This is of course an extremely liberal assumption and it's one that uh, is rather insidious in this film, but when you start to think about it, you should start to wonder, is that such a good thing? Is it, is it a good thing for um, a husband and wife to cheat on each other? You know, the Annette Benning character, she goes and has, you know, sex with the king at one point. This is what it's like to be nailed by the king, he says. Lester goes off and smokes some weed and has a kind of an affair with one of his daughter's friends. Uh, is this the real being true to yourself? If we were to be extremely charitable to the film, it may be self-aware enough to see that in a purely materialist culture, all you can really find are these rather trivial, uh, shallow and superficial things. But I'm not entirely convinced that the film is that self-aware. Let's have a look at the second point here. The idea that freaks are the well-adjusted people and that the normal quote-unquote people are all screwed up. Now, by freaks here, I mean the sorts of people that society has conventionally put on the margins. Um, for example, there's a gay couple uh, in the film, uh, played by uh, Scott Bakula and some other dude, and they are seen to be the most kind of well-adjusted people in the entire film. Whereas anybody with a 2.4 family uh, is seen as being messed up in the extreme, psychologically damaged, etc., etc. Now, while this is a nice kind of liberal fantasy, one has to ask, is well, is that necessarily the case? Is that true in reality? Is it true that the so-called freaks are the most well-adjusted people? Why would that ever be the case? And this is, of course, liberal projection onto conservatives, uh, which, which is something that you see quite, quite a lot in this movie. There is a, a, a really hideous exchange uh, between uh, the, the three teenage characters, uh, Angela, 
who is the American beauty played by uh, Mina Savari, uh, Jane played by Thora Birch, and uh, Ricky, who's played by Wes uh, Bentley. Uh, let me just read you some of this uh, dialogue. So basically Jane is trying to get involved with Ricky, who spends all his time obsessively for photographing the world. Um, and basically, uh, <clears throat> Angela says, Jane, you'd be out of your mind to go out with him. Jane says, why do you even care? Angela says, because you're my friend. Ricky comes in. She's not your friend. She's somebody you use to feel better about yourself. Angela, go fuck yourself, psycho. Jane, you shut up, bitch. Angela, Jane, he's a freak. Jane, well then, so am I. And we'll always be freaks and we'll never be like other people. And you'll never be a freak because you're just too perfect. Angela, oh yeah? Well, at least I'm not ugly. Ricky, yes. Yes, you are. And you're boring. And you're totally ordinary. And you know it. Angela stares at him stunned, then starts towards the door. You two deserve each other. Now we have the, this real kind of uh, revenge of the nerds, uh, revenge of the freaks uh, narrative that was very popular in 1999 when this uh, film was made. Now, this is really, uh, this is really, a, I think, a revolting piece of dialogue, especially when Ricky turns around to uh, Angela and basically says that she's ugly um, but because she's ordinary. And this, I think, is a very deep uh, liberal principle that uh, beauty, that external good looks don't matter. It's, quote, what's inside that counts. But in this case, what is inside? What, what, what's so special about Ricky and uh, Jane here, other than them not uh, necessarily conforming with social norms? This enough that marks them out as quote-unquote freaks. But this is somehow seen as enough for them to morally uh, put themselves above um, the Mina Savari character um, and also to declare her ugly, to take away the one thing that she has to set her apart from everyone else. She's obviously not ordinary. She's obviously stunning. She's obviously the, she, the, she is the American beauty. So th this is a, this I think is a, is a hateful, anti-beauty, anti-human uh, piece of dialogue that the film implicitly supports. Uh, this is the morality of American Beauty itself. I, I think the film is with Ricky when he says this, and we're meant to be cheering for the two freaks against the American Beauty. Now, wh why would this film have such a kind of skewed view on normality, and why would it want to celebrate its freaks in this way? Why would it present Scott Bakula as being more normal than the... Uh, than the families living there, and why would it want to try to champion, um, the, you know, the the abnormal couple Ricky and uh, Jane over the Angela character? Well, it turns out the the, the writer uh, of the screenplay, Alan Ball, uh, not only is gay but is a kind of LGBT uh, activist, and it's pretty clear in this film that he has an axe to grind against quote-unquote, normal America, Christian America. Of course, Kevin Spacey, the lead actor in the play, also is gay. Um, and the director, Sam Mendes, is Jewish on his mother's side, which then kind of puts him in a slightly outsider position when it comes to, uh, quote-unquote, mainstream society. Um, although he did grow up in Britain as opposed to America. Anyway, all of this brings me to my third liberal myth, which is that the beautiful girl is shallow, that is the Angela character, while the goth girl, Jane, is deep, aka the real beauty is inside. Now, I've already talked about this a little bit, but in this film it's particularly insidious because, as far as I can see, there is absolutely nothing deeper about Jane than there is in Angela. They're both just teenage girls, the only difference is, is that Angela is very hot and Jane is quite plain. I mean, that's literally all that separates these two. 
Um, this notion that the real beauty is inside, which is also seen in things like Shrek and, uh, you know, is all around us, you know, the fat positivity movement and wherever else, um, I think is incredibly subversive and wrong-headed. It makes no sense to assume that the real beauty is inside. Um, I mean, in the case of fat people versus thin people, obviously, overweight people have some sort of self-control problem. The the weight actually literally shows you something about their character. But then if even if you think about this uh, taking out choices in that way, someone who isn't good looking at all uh, will probably have greater cause to be bitter or resentful in some way, which will then reflect badly on their character. There's probably a reason why it has always been the case throughout literature, throughout culture, throughout the art in history, that uh, beauty was associated with goodness and ugliness was, associ was associated with evil. But in the liberal worldview, this is literally turned upside down. Um, what's very insidious, as I've already said in this film, is that as far as I can see, the Angela character is not... She's just a teenager. She's nothing really wrong with her. She just happens to be hot. Uh, and yet the film goes out of its way to vilify her in the name of championing the freaks. So let's move on to the next one, which is a character I've not talked about yet is Colonel Fitz, Ricky's father, who embodies the trope that conservatives who are against homosexuality are in fact closet homosexuals. Um, we find out in this film that uh, Colonel Fitz is a particularly unpleasant right wing former uh, army colonel or current army colonel um you know unpleasant character uptight and um there's a moment in the film later on where he's you know the lester burnham character goes and goes and sees him and somehow colonel fitz um you know he he, he misjudges the signals and goes in for a, for an embrace or a kiss uh, with, uh, with uh, Lester uh, in, in an embarrassing scene. Um, now, now, this really is a liberal fantasy, and it is possibly also a gay fantasy that Alan Ball has as well. And is one of the one of the most most insidious bits of nonsense um, that still rears its head all the time. Uh, I see uh, in debates now whenever anybody brings anything up. In fact, recently. Uh, with the whole, uh, you know, the trans kids debate. Uh, I, I have told uh, trans activists, you know, stay away from children. You should you should stay away from doing this. Uh, my friend Aaron McIntyre on Twitter says, you know, they just want to diddle your kids. Um, but I've, I have seen leftists try to use this same argument. Anybody who's concerned about paedophilia is a closet, is a closet paedophile, is the line. Um, th this is just absolute nonsense it's the it's the projection argument turned back on itself they imagine because they project everybody else projects as well um but to have it embodied in the reality of this film gives uh gives people a kind of subliminal go-to for this uh for this trope um so it, it, it's pretty insidious for that reason, because then you think you've seen examples of this in, in real life as well, where, whereas in fact this was just made up uh, by, by various subversive uh, creatives. Let's have a look at the fifth one, which is also related to Colonel Fitz. That is, wives to conservative men are victims of abuse. So if you have a look at the, the, the wife of uh, uh, Fitz, I actually think it's a fantastic uh, performance. It's not almost silent performance uh, by the actress whose um, name is uh, Alison uh, Janney. I always thought that she she would have she should have won an, like a best supporting um, actress Oscar for it. Um, but like, why do they imagine that uh, the conservative family unit has to be so miserable that you know they they're unhappy that they are that there's abuse going on, that there's you know, this closet homosexual, that he's abusive to his son. All of these attacks on the family are, again, liberal fantasies. 
I mean, I don't, I'm not going to pull up data in this video, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest that conservative people in family units are much happier than liberals in, you know, broken from, from broken families. Um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that conservatives uh, don't suffer from as many uh, social and mental conditions as liberals. You can pull up this data yourself. It's all it's all out there. Um, so so this constant attack on the family and the idea that um, you know a, a, a marriage like this has to be abusive. Uh, the only other marriage we see in the film, of course, is between Lester and. Um, and the Annette Benning character, and uh, you know that's completely dysfunctional, of course. So you, we either got like a couple who should be divorced and are dysfunctional, or a, or a couple that where the woman is being abused by the man, and that these are the two family units given to us by the gay writer. The only successful happy couple in the film is it, it, are two gay men who we see jogging by. Now I'm not going to say that it's impossible to have. Um, a well-adjusted gay couple living together like, like that. Of course, they do exist, but on average, most gay men don't have don't you know that just doesn't happen. On our, on average, the conservative family unit will be much happier than this. So, it is completely unrepresentative of the you know these kind of tropes that they're trying to put into the mind of the audience. It is. Uh, really unforgivable but of course this isn't uh, a film that is trying to reflect the truth this is a film that is trying to reflect a liberal fantasy version of the world that they're encouraging the audience to adopt and uh, like i said because this because the film is so well made so well acted uh, so well shot i mean the director of photography was a genius if you ask me um the music everything else when you're an 18, 19, 20 year old watching this, as I was, you, you kind of miss all of that, uh, what, what I'm pointing out here. And you just kind of accept it on it, on its, because you're, you know, you buy into the film. So all of these things I'm pointing out are working on the audience almost subliminally. It's almost just like you're inherit, you're absorbing these prejudices, these assumptions about the world, which are completely unrepresentative of the world. It's, um, yes. So so the, the sixth uh, liberal myth uh, in this film, the idea that work is oppression. Work in the film is just seen straightforwardly as oppressive. Lester is unhappy in his job. Um, every every work environment we see in the film is, uh, is an oppressive one. And it goes back to this idea that uh, to be true to yourself, you have to remove society from the equation you just um you know you just live out your kind of libido or your id uh, unrestrained pretty much um and uh, a work is yet another one of these oppressive social constructs it's very rousseauian uh, in that sense uh, there's never a sense that you could find meaning in your work or that work could be uh, fulfilling or uh, that you may find uh, aristotelian eudomania through work those concepts are entirely missing. Instead, what we have is uh, this, this juvenile escape, you know, liberation and escape fantasy that Lester has. Now, I don't want to be too harsh on the film here. I do think that the the film is at least aware enough to pose the question as to whether these attempts at escape uh, by Lester are indeed you know, actual escapes or whether they're just kind of juvenile fantasies that he has. That's in the film itself. But uh, ultimately, I I feel like the film does uh, lean towards this Rousseauian view that society is oppression and liberation comes from being the pure expression of the individual. Seventh, marriage is oppression. Now, I've already talked about how the conservative marriage is unhappy and the Burnham marriage is unhappy. Um, and uh, I don't think the film has much else to say about that. We don't really get a view of what a happy marriage might look like other than the gay, other than the gay couple who are jogging by. So it's almost like in the liberal gay fantasy world constructed by Alan Ball, 
uh, in this film, there is no happy straight option. There is no there is no um, marriage that is not oppression. And then eighth, the family unit is oppression. The fa the family unit itself is seen as something that can only lead to these very dark things. The the only option for the family unit is to escape from it. Number nine, taking drugs is liberation. Now, I've already talked about how Lester's uh, fantasies of escape are juvenile, but one of the things that he does is he goes and, uh, goes and gets himself some marijuana and has a few spliffs around the back of the shed. You know, transgressive, boomer idea of liberation. And yet, I feel like the film kind of buys into that a little bit as well. That Lester is happier when he's doing that, at least um, in the film's own terms, than when he's at work or when he's in his marriage or when he's in his family unit, which are all seen as a, a, a near hellscape. At least when he's taking the drugs around the back of the shed, he feels like he's he feels like he's happy. Um, and I don't think that, like I said, the film is ambiguous in places, but I don't think it's self-aware enough to see how empty and ultimately shallow and non-transcendent um, the, the juvenile escapism is, ultimately. It does not escape the Boomer Truth regime itself. And then finally, uh, there is the famous uh, plastic bag and the idea that beauty can be found in the mundane. Now, according to uh, Alan Ball's Wikipedia page, uh, he said he Ball is a practicing Buddhist, and he said he he said um, in an interview that the plastic bag scene in American Beauty um, was about this. He said I had an encounter with a plastic bag, and I didn't have a video camera like Ricky does, but a Buddhist notion of the miraculous within the mundane, and I think we certainly live in a culture that encourages us not to look for that. Ah. Now, it would be okay if this encounter with the plastic bag did have something genuinely transcendent about it. And presumably, if you're a true practicing Buddhist, if you, if, you know, you could find something profound in that. But I, I don't think this film comes anywhere close to finding uh, something profound in that plastic bag. It's a materialist film. Um, it's a mater The world of the film is materialist. And I don't believe that Ricky's, um, you know, the, 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 the little um, emotionally manipulative music that they put underneath there um, and Ricky's filming of this plastic bag does achieve anything close to something profound. It's funny because earlier on today I happened to um, I I happened to have to uh, take I had to take my car to a garage, and I went to a place that I don't usually go, um, and I was reminded of this scene because there were plastic bags everywhere, and um, you know there were le there were kind of leaves because it's autumn at the moment there were leaves all over the ground red and yellow and and uh, you know brown and. Uh, you know, buried in amongst them, they were like crisp bags, plastic bags, and like disused uh, masks, you know, from the pandemic. And I looked down there and I thought, hmm, beauty in the mundane. Made me think about American beauty in this plastic bag. And I thought, is this the bankruptcy of a culture that really cannot see beauty? You know, this is a film that has taught us for the past two hours that Freaks are more beautiful than people who have actual beauty. That uh, marriage is bad. That um, work is bad. That um, nobody can uh, really have a happy relationship unless they abandon all social norms. Um, but yet, yeah, the plastic bag, this is the ultimate thing. Hmm. This is pseudo profundity, isn't it? It's it's uh, it's standing in for uh, something that should be profound, but isn't.
because um, ultimately American Beauty, I'm sorry to say, is a very shallow film that uh, simply reflects the uh, politically motivated prejudices of the people who made it in a pretty hateful way in places, it has to be said. Anyway, let me know what you make of my analysis in the comments. Maybe you disagree and think American Beauty is still a great film and that holds up and you've seen it recently and, uh, you know, think I've missed something. If so, let me know and uh, I'll see you next time. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years, from the time of Aristotle through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out.